Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Dermot Roberts, and I'll be chairing session four of the conference today. Uh, and that's going to be about electrochemical storage. Uh, we have six talks, all from within the CDT. Uh, the first three are from University of Sheffield, and the second three are going to be from Southampton. Uh, but yeah, I'll, I'll try to stick to time because it's quite a long session. Uh, so first speaker is Sylvia Gillenskete, who's going to be talking about biotemplating synthesis of cathode materials for sodium ion batteries. So Sylvia, if you can get your slides up and start. Yep, yeah, sure. Uh, can you see the screen okay? Yeah, you're good. Awesome. Hi, um, I'm Sylvia and my PhD project is um, biotemplating synthesis of sodium nickel manganese oxide cathode material for sodium ion batteries. So dive straight in with some background. So as we all know, um, lithium ion batteries have pretty much, well, the really important in, in, modern, in the modern world, um, especially for portable electronics. They're increasingly being used for electric vehicles and stationary grid storage um, in order to battle climate change. However, there, there are some issues with lithium. Um, starting with lithium is not really abundant and it's expected price to increase further in the future. Also, there is debate as to whether there will be enough lithium in the future to meet demand. However, not all applications um, do require um, these high energy, energy dense lithium ion batteries. For large scale applications like space for good storage, mass and size of the battery isn't really important. So we can potentially go for something else. And that something else is sodium ion batteries. So the, Advantages of these is that sodium is cheap and it's abundant. Also, you make extra savings um, due to being able to use aluminium current collector on the anode instead of copper, like it is used in lithium ion batteries. And also they have the same working principles as lithium ion batteries. So the technology can easily be transferred to current um, lithium ion battery uh, systems. However, there are some is issues associated with sodium ion batteries, and one of them is due to the large ionic radius of sodium compared to lithium. So this causes a sluggish kinetics because of the large ionic size. And due to this ionic size, um, you get phase transitions during cycling. Um, so the example here, we see um, a P2 layer transition oxide um, can transition to the O2, and you can get um, large volume changes, and this can cause structural instability and um, reduce, I guess, the performance and cycle life. And also another thing is that some structures that the materials uh, transition to have a higher diffusion energy barrier. So this again affects the kinetics. Also, Generally, sodium ion batteries have lower energy density compared to lithium ion. However, for large applications, as I mentioned pre previously, this isn't really an issue. However, recent uh, literature has shown that energy densities of sodium ion batteries are gradually increasing. So watch this space. Um, so issues associated with kinetics can be potentially resolved um, by reducing particle size as this would increase the surface area and diffusion the shorten and diffusion uh, shorten the diffusion length of the sodium ions. So this is exactly what we did in one of our previous studies. Um, we investigated the effect of particle size of um, P3 sodium nickel manganese oxide cathode material. And we used um, dextran biotemplating synthesis to make these materials. So to control the particle size, the furnace temperature and dwell times were controlled. And generally, smaller particle sizes were found at 
lower temperatures and shorter dwell times. And the capacities were much higher for these materials due to um, the reasons explained previously, like shorter diffusion lengths. So as you can see that in uh, this uh, image here, um, we have quite a small particle size of 124 nanometers on average. And such a small particle size is made possible using biotemplating synthesis. Um, however, we do have a recurring issue uh, with these materials is that we do have nickel oxide impurity phases present in these samples. However, um, I'll get into this uh, later on in the presentation. So what is biotemplating synthesis? So biotemplating synthesis uses biotemplates and biopolymers in order to influence the particle size or the morphology. So here are some examples of biopolymers that have been used. So chitosan, that's derived from shrimp shells. We have alginate from seaweed and dextran that is made from sucrose by enzymic fermentation by bacteria. And interestingly, chitosan and alginate have been used to make nanorods for some functional materials in the liquid itself. So how does this method work? So what you do is you dissolve your precursor salts like um, acetates in water and you mix it with the biopolymer. So in the solution, the biopolymer deprotonates forming negatively charged chelation sites. And at these negatively charged chelation sites, the cations from the precursors are able to bind to the biopolymer. Then you dry the solution and what you have is a hard gel. And the biopolymer essentially um, trapped all these cations in a homogeneous mixture at the atomic level. And then you put this gel into the furnace and at early stages of synthesis, while the biopolymer is still present in the gel, it prevents um, agglomer agglomeration and growth of intermediate phases up until the point that the biopolymer begins to decompose. And then you start forming numerous nucleation sites. And because of the large number of nucleation sites, um, you get uh, reactions happening at lower temperatures and shorter dwell times. And then finally, what you left is your desired material without the template, but smaller particle size. So here are the general aims of my project. So as I mentioned previously, I've had some issues with having nickel oxide impurity phase among material, uh, investigate how to control this. And secondly, is to optimize the selection of biopolymer to synthesize different sodium ion cathode materials by investigating the interactions of different metal cations. So let's start the, uh, with this issue of nickel oxide. So one way of potentially controlling the amount of nickel oxide impurity in my material is to increase the amount of template that I use. So for one gram of product of sodium nickel manganese oxide, I vary the amount of dextran used during synthesis. So at the bottom here, um, I use half a gram of dextran and at the top is four grams. So as you can see, as the amount of template used, the nickel oxide, pe uh, nickel oxide peaks that are highlighted by the black dot decrease in intensity. And this can be attributed to the increased number of chelation sites. So this ensures that most of the cations are trapped by um, the biopolymer, the X-strand in this case, ensuring that there are fewer cations that are free to react and grow into whatever phases they want. But as you can see, after a certain amount, there is no significant difference in the amount of nickel oxide present. Um, so we still have this issue, but we'll get into that later. So to understand as to why there is such a big difference in the amount of nickel oxide um, between the different amounts of dextran used, uh, we need to look at what is happening at temperatures at which the biotemplate begins to burn off, which is around 300 degrees. So for that, 
example that used high amount of dextran during synthesis, we can see there's not much happening at these lower temperatures. And then at 270 degrees, we start getting manganese oxide and nickel compounds. And then at 300 degrees, we start seeing our P3 NNM phase along with um, nickel oxide shown in the black dots again. But the peaks are fairly broad, so an indication that the particle size, or at least crystallite size, of nickel oxide is still fairly small. Whereas quite a different situation when we use a lower concentration of dextran during synthesis. So at these lower temperatures, there seems to be something going on. It could be the precursor acetates reforming again in the hard gel. Um, as we increase the temperature, we get similar phases present. And as we increase the temperature, the peaks of these phases only seem to get more intense. And we don't see um, the P3 NNM phase. So if we continue this temperature study, so in the high dextran example, the only thing that happens is that the nickel oxide peaks get smaller. Great. However, in the low dextran example, we still see this crazy soup of different um, phases present. And as we increase the temperature to 600 degrees, we do start seeing NNM finally, but the nickel oxide peaks are pretty huge and quite narrow indicating of a large crystallite size. So we can see what role dextran plays um, in the synthesis of this material. It's really important to have enough to control um, these secondary phases, but as we can see, it's not perfect. We still see nickel oxide. Um, so there is a theory to explain as to why this is the case. And that theory is potentially hard soft acid base theory. So it's a theory that explains the st stability of metal complexes. So it treats um, the metal cations as Lewis acids. So they accept electron pairs. And the ligand or the biopolymer is treated as a Lewis base and it donates an electron pair. And it explains that like prefers like. So you get more stable complexes formed between a hard acid and a hard base and a more stable complex with a soft acid and a soft base. And here are the categories that the ions I'm working in fall into. So sodium and manganese are considered as hard acids. So they are likely to form a um, stable complex with hydroxyl groups in dextran, which is considered a hard base. However, nickel is considered more of an intermediate ion. So you need to find like a biopolymer with functional groups that are more intermediate in character. So one potential option could be chitosan. So chitosan has these amine groups that have electron uh, free pair at the amine group. And this is where cations are able to uh, bind onto the biopolymer. So this is only possible at pHs higher than 6.5. And this is pretty much the range that I work in. So it has been used in polymer uh, assisted ultrafiltration studies to remove metal cations from water such as nickel. So I thought might as well give it a go. And um, here are the results. It's looking worse than dextran, far worse. Um, so I wanted to know why. And to know why, we need to look at um, the interaction strength uh, between the biopolymers and the cations and how it differs between dextran and chitosan. So one of the experiments that I have used to look at this is I basically mixed the uh, precursor solution with um, insoluble biopolymer, such as chitosan, um, and then I put it through a Buckner funnel. So the insoluble chitosan remained in, in the funnel, along with all the cations that were able to chelate onto it. And then anything that hasn't been chelated onto the biopolymer um, basically fell through the um, porous plate and into, and into the flask along with the water. So 
So I did um, the same experiment with cross-linked dextran, which is also insoluble. And then I took this solid residue from both of these um, solutions and put them into the furnace to see what type of phases will form um, with the available um, metal atoms that were caught by the biopolymer. And here are the results. So cross-linked dextran, the XOD pattern shows something that is essentially looks like D3 NNM. So it's clearly been able to uptake enough variety of metal cations to form this structure. Whereas we see quite a different story with Phytoban. So we pretty much see only nickel oxide and a tiny amount of another phase that couldn't really work out what it was. So clearly chitosan is very good at uptaking nickel and not much else. So the potential impact of having unchelated or weakly bound cations is that while the bi template is still present, these cations are essentially free and able to react at low temperatures while the bio template is still present. So this allows unconstrained growth of these intermediate phases, which would require more energy to, to decompose and participate in the formation of, for example, P3 and NM. So they are likely to persist at higher temperatures, as we have seen, making it harder to form a, a phase pure material. So ideally, we need to find like a bio template that can bind all these cations um, similarly to some extent. So as this would ensure a more homogeneous mixture of these um, at atoms at an atomic level, and it would prevent agglomeration and growth of intermediate phases. So less likely to have, um, oh, sorry, it's more likely to have less nickel oxide at the end of synthesis. So that's something I am still pursuing. So I guess here that's are my conclusions. Minutes. Yeah, <laughs> final, final slide. Um, so yeah, my conclusion says that adding more dextran into the synthesis, the decrease the amount of nickel oxide impurity, but you don't completely get rid of it. And you get earlier crystallization of P3 and NM, which is quite good for reducing the energy of the synthesis process. You also see a simpler crystallization process. So chrysazan is really good at uptaking nickel ions and nothing else. So it's not really good for sodium ion batteries, I guess. And then so it clearly shows we need to think carefully about the choice of template for the different cations that we have, because it does have a significant impact. And here are my acknowledgements. So I want to thank all these people and centers for making my research possible. So that's the end. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Sylvia. Very interesting. Uh, if anyone's got any questions, please put them in the chat now. OK, so. A question is coming right away. Uh, have you got ideas for the next template? And are there any considerations about sustainability and vegan issues in your work? Um, so I do. So I'm thinking of uh, potentially using um, carrageenan, which is another type of seaweed. So it has um, a sulfur. Uh, dioxide functional group. So I think that might be a bit more intermediate in character. So hopefully it might be able to bind to nickel as well as the other cations. So I'm going to try that, see what happens. And I guess also, I guess sustainability. So chitosan is, um, I think, one of the most um, available biopolymers there is out there, like there's a lot of chitosan waste. Um, uh, yeah, I understand about the whole vegan thing. Um, <laughs> I guess if it's if it's there, but ideally, I personally wouldn't want to use it. I mean, there are other ones available, like different types of alginates and seaweeds that could be potentially used. They might be better, they might be worse. It's just giving things a go. Okay. Uh, I'll ask a quick question. Uh, it's a bit of a general one. Do these bio templates, uh, before you put them in the battery, has all the carbon been completely removed? 
Yes. Remove the template. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. All right. Uh, any other questions people have, leave them in the chat and I'm sure Sylvia can answer them. But thank you for the talk. Uh, let's move on to Jeffro Pryke, our next speaker. And Jeffro is going to be talking about cathode materials for magnesium ion batteries. Is that done the thing? Yep, that's good. Cool. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to talk about cathode materials for magnesium ion batteries. I'm going to start off with like a quick review of sort of the field and then I'm going to move on to um, what I've been doing. Uh, so start off with the, the reason for the whole thing. Uh, climate change is obviously really bad. Um, uh, obviously, CO2 emissions are causing a rise in temperature. So the solution for that is to reduce the CO2 emissions. So for, um, for the energy grid, wind turbines, solar panels and stuff, but that needs energy storage, as we all know, uh, to make it more reliable. Uh, and for transport, cars, um, electric cars are a good solution. Uh, batteries are useful in these areas because of the high energy density and um, they're portable, uh, but there are loads of other energy storage types as we all know. Um, so let's start off with how a metal ion battery works. So, uh, so um, you have your anode, you have a separator, you have a cathode, and when the battery is uh, fully charged, all of the lithium ions or magnesium ions or sodium ions are all sitting in the anode. Uh, but as you can see on this graph on the left, so this is energy on the left-hand side, the lithium in the cathode material, so lithium cobalt oxide in this example, has a lower energy than just the lithium, uh, either just as a solid lithium or in the graphite anode in this case. Uh, this makes the ions want to, it gives them this, this difference in energy or potential energy is potential difference. So this gives, this is the driving force for the anode, for, for the lithium ions wanting to go to the cathode. So as they make this journey, it causes the electrons who cannot go through the separator because it does not um, let electrons through, goes through the wires and then through your uh, light or whatever and joins the ions in the cathode. And then it's and then your battery is discharged when the cathode is saturated. So you just reverse this process to charge it up again. So you attach, you, you put a current on this on this wire and it pulls the electrons back. And that and those electrons moving back kind of forces the ions to go back into the anode. So um, so why 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 am I looking at magnesium when lithium batteries uh, doing stuff quite happily. Uh, so the main reason is magnesium, for every magnesium uh, ion, you get two electrons, whereas lithium you only get one. So this gives you uh, twice, almost twice, the volumetric capacity uh, with magnesium. Um, so that's great for any volumetrically constrained applications. Uh, however, you don't get as much uh, capacity in the uh, gravimetrically. Uh, so maybe for electric cars, lithium is still going to win out because uh, weight is very important. I must add that this is the kind of anode capacity. So lithium uses graphite. Often lithium batteries use graphite in uh, real world use. So these values are lower, uh, really. Um, and also there's the other part of the of lithium supply. So lithium is much more expensive, as you can see with the yellow bars, uh, mostly due to the fact that it's a lot less abundant. Um, as you can see, 2% of the Earth's crust is magnesium. It's going to be a lot less for lithium. Uh, as well as that, a lot of the lithium that's easy to extract, which is in lithium brine, is in uh, South America. And there's, out of the rock, um, you can get quite, uh, Australia have quite a lot, but there are a limited supply generally. Uh, whereas magnesium, can you can get it out of seawater and you can extract it from lots of different kinds of rocks. So it's much more available, uh, which is good geopolitically. 
Um, so why hasn't it been done yet? So the challenges to do with a cathode are mostly around the ionic radii, basically. Sort of. uh, so the ionic radii for lithium, for lithium ion is 0 0.76 Armstrongs, and for magnesium, it's 0 0.72. However, magnesium, you've got, uh, it's divalent. So you've got twice the charge in a smaller radius, which means the charge density is very, very high, which means that while it's trying to travel through your um, cathode material, it interacts a lot more with the cathode, uh, possibly stopping its movement or at least slowing it down, reducing the power density of uh, magnesium batteries. So in this example here, we have V205 cathode, um, and they've uh, found the energy barrier for um, a lithium ion to move from its first uh, site to another site, to a neighboring site. And this ranges, depending on how much lithium is already in the material, from uh, well, like 0 0.15 um, to 0 0.4 electron volts energy barrier, so it can move. Whereas for magnesium, this is a lot higher, so 0 0.7 to 1.3. So this is quite a substantial difference and um, is a big challenge to overcome. Along with that, you have electrolyte uh, problems. So uh, with a magnesium uh, um, anode uh, and the wrong kind of electrolyte, the electrolyte breaks down on the anode and creates an impermeable passivation layer, which the magnesium ions cannot penetrate and basically ruins the battery. But there are some electrolytes that don't have this that don't cause this, um, but and then there's so many other properties in an electrolyte to look at. This is like uh, reduces your electrolyte uh, availability. Lithium systems, you have your SI, SEI formation, which uh, has its own problems, but the lithiums can go through it. So this isn't a problem that's been solved for lithium batteries uh, as much because there's less of a need. Um, so the first kind of successful um magnesium battery famously is this uh chevrolet phase one from Arbach. and it, the, the reason it works is because it has 12 sites in between these um sulfur cubes which you can sort of see in the material here and kind of there's one buried in there um and in site a you can have one magnesium in any of these sites a's and you can have another magnesium in any of these B sites. And all of these are kind of in line along a, a channel in the material. And this allows the magnesium to, to move quite easily through the material, um, which is great. Uh, but the limits here are, so for this uh, battery to work with a, they've used a magnesium anode, they've had to use this electrolyte which is limited to two volts. And if it goes over two volts, it starts breaking down. So it's a low voltage battery um, and, it, and its uh, capacity is, a, is all right. It's not as, hasn't, they haven't gotten the full theoretical capacity, but um, it's about 75 or so. Uh, and you can see in the plateaus on the voltage curve, the different sites being filled, first site A and then site B. Um, and they also tested it over a high number of cycles and it hasn't lost too much um, uh, capacity, but this is, um, you know, very low current density. Um, so the voltage being the problem here, it being very low voltage, giving it a low capacity, how to solve this, uh, find a cathode material with a higher electronegativity. So in this periodic table, stuff top right has a higher electronegativity. So oxygen is a good bet. Uh, it also has high chemical stabilities and other stabilities. Uh, but oxygen extenuates the problem of the magnesium ion getting trapped or slowed in the material. So solutions to reduce this problem is to increase the distance between the uh, oxygen or the material itself and the magnesium ion. So having large gaps in a layered material or bigger channels. Um, another solution is just to re reduce the diffusion distance completely. So uh, you just physically have a much thinner 
cathode so that the magnesium doesn't have to travel as far. Uh, or you can shield the magnesium with things like water uh, that has some other problems as well. Um, so one type of oxide that was tried is MnO2 because of, it has this nice square tunnel structure that you can see going through the material um, and lots of them. And also it's quite adjustable. There's, there's three, these three phases, you can see that there's, you can have different size channels depending on what works and what doesn't and how much uh, space you want to use up with the materials or use up with the just space in the material and compared to the uh, magnesium being able to travel through it. Um, this group, Zhang, tried this hollandite phase, hollandite phase, um, but they found quite quickly that the tunnel structures actually collapsed with the magnesium uh, going through it, reducing their capacity. So there's more kind of work to look out on that one. Um, another good oxide option is the vanadates. Um, this is because it can have multiple oxidation, oxidation states, as you can see here, uh, which allows um, you to add more magnesium uh, because it's got multi-electron capability. Uh, as well as that, it has multiple unoccupied non-bonding orbitals, which means that when, uh, due to an oxidation state change, they are filled with electrons, um, the change in uh, volume of the whole material is less than if they were uh, bonding orbitals, um, which would reduce the strain on the material and therefore hopefully extend its life. Um, so an interesting vanadate oxide material is H2V308. Um, it's quite interesting because it's got hydrogen in it. So um, it would be interesting to see how the hydrogen affects the material. Uh, you can't see hydrogen on uh, XRD. So people aren't fully sure exactly where the hydrogen sits in the material, but we assume it's uh, somewhere in these gaps, in, in, the, in the layers, in the gaps between the layers. Um, and we're not yet sure if they are there as hydroxyl groups or water groups. Um, so we'll be interested to find out. Um, and also you've got your know, different oxidation states present. And also it's, it starts without any magnesium or lithium in it. So, um, so it starts fully charged. So you can try it with different ions, different battery types. Uh, so it's quite good to compare how they move. Uh, and it forms in these uh, nano rod, um, nano structure, um, which is good because it increases the surface area, so you have more contact with the electrolyte, um, allowing more exchanges between the contact, uh, between the cathode material and the electrolyte. Uh, and also it provides channels for the ions to travel quickly uh, through. Um, so some people who have looked at this is Brascu et al. Et al. Uh, and they found that the temperature has actually got a massive effect on, on how it works. Um, so they just increased the temperature not massively and got more than double the capacity, which was quite interesting. Uh, they also did um, some uh, cycling tests to see how, how it degrades over time and it, it does drop off a bit. Uh, it's important to note here that they've used a graphite anode, um, which is because the electrolyte they've used doesn't work with the magnesium anode. So, um, and that's one of the, the big advantage for the magnesium battery is that you can use magnesium anode. So, um, so this is where we thought we'd uh, jump in and have have a go. So, in collaboration with um, with lots of help from Sam and Marco in uh, Serena's group, uh, we've I've synthesized um, HGB308 with a silver thermal reaction, which is where you uh, in a closed vessel, you heat the um, reactants in a solvent at a temperature much higher than the solvent's boiling point. So uh, we went for 185 degrees, but the boiling point of IPA in solvent is um, 82 degrees. So you get this high pressure and that allows you to um, 
access high pressure phases and metastable phases that you wouldn't be able to get without that pressure um, and that more, more, and that nano morphology. Um, we use a microwave to heat the uh, heat the reactants um, to this high temperature and pressure. Um, and that's five minutes, Jeffro. Okay, cool. Uh, and Vex ID it and we get a uh, reasonable um, link to pre like the known structure. Uh, so after making many um, batteries with different electrolytes and many of them not working, we found that this electrolyte did okay, uh, but its voltage is limited to um, about 2.25 volts or two and a half volts or so versus magnesium. So, um, you know, we want to look at more stuff, but basically we discharged one battery completely and then took it apart. We got another battery and we charged it. Uh, we, we, sorry, we discharged it and then we charged it and we took that one apart and we did XIDs of them, the XIDs. Uh, uh, so this black line is the original electrolyte and then discharge is this blue and then discharge and then recharge this red electrolyte. And then if you look at the different planes, so the 200 plane is in the plane that cuts the uh, A axis in the cell, uh, you can see that after um, being discharged and charged, there's a shift in this peak, which is this peak here, zoomed in uh, to the right. And in this peak here, there is a shift to the left. Uh, so that shows that there is actually a change in the material. It's not just like the whole, um, XRD moving. Uh, and this graph is the same as on the previous slide. And then you do some Rietveld refinement and you can get the cell parameters. So uh, this in the black is the A, A cell parameter. So in this, in this direction. And from um, no magnesium in the material, pristine state to magnesium being put in the material, discharging the battery, you can see there's a reduction in the A lattice parameter, which is um, you know, up and down. So all of these gaps are reducing, uh, like being pushed together. Uh, so this is likely, it might be due to the magnesium's um, high uh, charge density, kind of pulling the, the layers together. You see the B um, lattice parameter, which is in and out of the page on this picture, has um, increased, so it's kind of stretched, and the C left parameter, left and right, has also increased, um, which is quite interesting, and the volume has decreased. So the, that uh, those layers being squished together is kind of more um, more impactful on the volume. Uh, however, when we look at when it's been to what it's been recharged, and the original. So in theory, both of these should be the same, kind of with no magnesium in the cathode material. You can see that uh, it hasn't quite gotten up to that height, up to that uh, size. So there's some, um, uh, what's the word? Unreversible, irreversible change happening in the material. Uh, same in the B parameter, that just hasn't really changed between uh, being with uh, magnesium being extracted. Um, but it's likely that this irreversible behavior is because we're limited to the voltage. So we don't actually have the voltage to pull all that magnesium out. Um, so that's something to look at. Uh, so in conclusion, there's some big challenges with magnesium batteries, both in the cathode and the um, electrolyte. Uh, but there's lots of different materials to look out there. It's a big world. Um, and some, some future work is we have some high quality H2V308 samples. So we want to try some different electrolytes to allow us to access that higher voltage. Um, so this electrolyte here is a good option. Um, just waiting for it to arrive in the lab for a few months. Uh, we also want to do some XAS. Uh, to better understand the oxidation state changes in vanadium as the ma magnesium is put in and out of the battery um, and other structural changes. And we'd also like to look at uh, B307, which would be quite interesting because it's a similar sort of structure, but 
there isn't hydrogen, so it'd be nice to compare what the hydrogen is actually doing um, in the H2V308. Uh, in theory, it should buffer the material to kind of help uh, reduce volume change, but maybe it also uh, shields the magnesium in theory from the um, kind of from uh, reacting with the material. Uh, and I'm also doing computational stuff as part of my project uh, with DFT, and I'm currently looking into cluster expansion technique, which will allow me to predict the voltage profile and diffusivity in the materials, um, which is all uh, very exciting. And acknowledgements, I want to thank everyone, especially Marco and Sam, for helping me lots. Any questions? Thanks, Jeff. Uh, oh, yes, we have a couple popping up here. Uh, uh, the first question, are there any problems with impurities when using magnesium? Um, what do you mean, impurities in the magnesium itself or impurities uh, like with the cathode structure? Good question. Can the questioner clarify that, please? With the cathode structure. Um, as in like uh, magnesium forming new things within the material and that becoming an impurity sort of thing. Um, so I think this has been a problem in uh, a lot because of the magnesium kind of getting stuck in the structure, but I'm not entirely sure um, really. Okay, let's move on then. There's one, there's one more question here. Uh, from John Owen. He's actually posted a couple, but we've only got time for the first one. Uh, have you considered oxysulfides for better magnesium mobility? Um, and for higher voltage? So I haven't looked at them personally, uh, but I've come across them. Um, but it's definitely worth having a look. Yeah, it's good to have an open mind and uh, look at lots of materials, but at the moment we're focusing on the vanadates because we think it, 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 it's quite exciting with the ability to kind of compare it to lithium so quite easily and um, kind of see how the hydrogen uh, might affect the material. Okay. Uh, <laughs> cheers, Jeffro. Uh, there's, there was one more question from John Owen there. Perhaps you can answer in the, the chat, but we need to um, move on to keep on schedule. So thanks. Cool. Uh, so next up is George Wilson, who's going to talk about the effect on morpho morphology and performance of biotemplating uh, for sodium ion cathode, well, another sodium ion cathode material. I'm not going to read yes. that structure. George can clarify that. Hi. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yeah, I can. Cool. Can... Okay, second question. Can everyone see the screen? Yep. Cool. And can everyone oh. and can everyone see the laser pointer? Yeah. Fantastic. All right. Cool. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Hi, my name is George. I'm in cohort four of the Energy Storage CDT in Sheffield, and I'm working on sodium ion batteries. Uh, this talk is about the different cathode structures that we see in sodium ion batteries and how their uh, their synthesis can affect performance. So. Uh, you know, I, I, other speakers have already mentioned this, but uh, lithium ion batteries are excellent and have their place in the in the energy storage market. But for larger scale uh, energy storage, particularly moving towards uh, cheaper and more sustainable materials, is going to be important going forwards. Um, so that's why I want to work on sodium ion batteries. Um, they generally the cathode structures look something like this on the on the right hand side. Uh, they take the form of what's called layered oxides, which have uh, this structure, this NaMeO2 uh, structure. Uh, and they are grouped according to two different features. One is the sodium site geometry, which can either be octahedral or prismatic. 
and the repeating layer pattern. So how many repeating layer slabs are they? Uh, are they? And uh, most commonly, you'll find either P2 or O3. Uh, and each have their own um, benefits and drawbacks. There's some kind of trade-off being made uh, with each one between capacity and stability and kinetics. So um, typically, uh, octahedral uh, uh, type cathodes will have quite high, uh, high capacity because they form at high sodium contents, which uh, is great. But unfortunately, the geometry of the octahedral site tends to cost you a little bit in terms of capacity because an energy barrier has to be overcome uh, or more of an energy barrier has to be overcome in comparison to uh, prismatic type uh, cathodes in order to get the sodium ion to diffuse through the structure. Uh, conversely then, uh, prismatic type cathodes can give you quite good kinetics, but unfortunately you lose storage because it forms at uh, sodium, uh, like, uh, it forms when you have a more sodium deficient material. We're talking about like um, sodium sort of 0.7 or so uh, in, this, in this formula, and you form uh, prismatic structures. Uh, also, uh, P2 is a little limited in its uh, voltage because it tends to, at high voltages, form uh, O2 or OP4 uh, type cathodes, which uh, is a uh, reasonably irreversible phase transition, or at least like a lot of uh, very rapid degradation in the battery structure or in the battery uh, capacity. Um, they are very rarely directly compared. Um, I managed to find uh, one structure that quite neatly compared P2 and uh, O3. So just as a quick example, uh, this blue line here shows a P2 uh, cathode, which has a quite, starts off with a quite high capacity and then very rapidly uh, deteriorates. Uh, and then compare that to an O3 cathode, which has um, a slightly lower capacity, but uh, is very well maintained. I think this is a function of the fact that the phase transitions that the O3 cathode goes through uh, is quite reversible. And the, uh, the phase transition is generally this O3 to P3 uh, phase transition. If I just go back a slide, it's, it's this, it, the, uh, this phase transition is very, very common. Um, P3, however, uh, is, very, is not very commonly uh, reported on. It's, it's quite difficult to synthesize because it's, uh, essentially the low temperature version of, of P2. And that means that you're quite likely to get a lot of impurities in it. Um, so even though it has like quite a similar structure and should have a lot of the same benefits, uh, it's reported on quite rarely. Uh, but it's important to understand its behavior because we, you know, it could end up being quite a useful, a useful tool when coming up with novel sodium batteries. Uh, so we decided uh, we, we decided to make P3. Um, the uh, cathode, the specific cathode we decided to make is this sodium manganese magnesium oxide, which has been made uh, using a solid state, which is a uh, uh, synthesis, which is like a quite a, a standard technique. Um, it is it's a, like a very good cathode. It is cobalt and nickel free, which is excellent in terms of uh, sustainability and cost. Uh, it's very high capacity up to, uh, uh, it has been reported up to 175 uh, million pounds per gram. Um, the, so the way we managed to make this P3 uh, cathode is by using uh, biotemplating. Again, this was mentioned in, uh, in a, a previous uh, presentation, so I'm not going to dwell on it too much, but biotemplating allows us uh, quite good control over particle size and morphology, uh, allows us access to new phases because it brings uh, the ions together in solution and so you get some like atomic homogeneity and so you are able to form uh, phases at or like a, a lower temperature phase, so it's great for accessing this P3 phase, as you also get much shorter calcination times. So um, this is the dextran structure here. Uh, in solution, it binds to metal ions like this, and then you heat it up, uh, you, you, you dry the, the water off so it uh, forms a gel, and then you heat it up and you get your product out at the end. Uh, so you get quite good selectivity for your phases, which we'll see in a couple of slides time. 
So what we're aiming to do is synthesize this sodium manganese magnesium oxide or MM, uh, NMMO via both biotemplating and solid state and synthesize both the P3 and P2 NMMO phases. So we can characterize them and then uh, electrochemically test them and see if any of the differences there are a result of the uh, synthesis technique that we use. Um, one thing I'm just going to flag quickly here is that the biotemplated uh, samples are calcined for 20 hours. Uh, this is because doing things with solid state took 20 hours. And in order to keep things uh, the same across all samples or like as similar as possible, uh, the biotemplate is done for 20 hours. But I would usually, if unless I, if I'm not comparing them to something else, I would usually be able to do it in like a, a two hour calcination rather than 20. Uh, so the this uh, is the these are the XRD patterns of uh, all four samples. Um, they were all like made very successfully. Um, the XRD shows that the both the P two phases, so both solid state and biotemplated P two, are phase pure, and as is the biotemplated P three phase. Uh, but unfortunately, there are some impurities in the P three solid state. Uh, these uh, marks by a little asterisk here. Um, it's quite a minor phase, but it does speak to how difficult P3 can be to form just using standard techniques. But it's very encouraging that we are able to form this P3 phase uh, using biotemplating uh, in, a, in a phase pure uh, way. The, so this is the SEM. Um, as you can, so the both of the P2 samples are larger than their, are larger than both of the P3 samples uh, by about an order of magnitude. We'll see some of the more, uh, some of the numbers on the next slide, um, but that's simply just a um, a function of the higher calcination temperatures that we used. So 900 versus uh, 580 degrees for P2 versus P3. Uh, so that's what uh, one of the, the that's probably the reason that uh, the P2 uh, particles look so much bigger. Uh, so if we look at the actual uh, particle size distribution, uh, the biotemplated particles uh, are actually slightly smaller and with a narrower size distribution than their solid state counterparts. So the biotemplated P2 is slightly smaller than the solid state P2. And similarly, the biotemplated P3 is smaller than the solid state P3. Uh, this is like despite identical thermal conditions. So despite everything being made in the same way, we still see effects of the end results as a res uh, of the end product as a result of the synthesis technique that we're using. Um, and this is quite promising because smaller and more consistent crystallite sizes are very promising for electrochemistry. So we tested the batteries. Um, this is the first uh, 10 cycles at uh, 0.05 C versus sodium methyl. Uh, the first thing to note is that the these three cells all slowly increase in capacity as the cycling goes on, which is likely to be a result of so, so cycling against um, a sodium metal anode. Uh, so you, the, we have an infinite well of sodium on the other side of the cell. Uh, so uh, after a while, you're just going to end up with more sodium being transferred back and forth as you cycle. Uh, the second thing to note is that this um, biotemplated P2 is only partially uh, discharged because the uh, cycling regime cuts off. I think it was like a uh, time limited and cut off. So there's actually some more capacity that we could get out of it. Um, but I'm not able to show you that right now. Um, so analyzing this then, we can see that the P2 have quite high, uh, like quite high um, specific capacities that with the biotemplated one being slightly higher. The biotemplated one is about 153 milliamp hours per gram and the solid state is 149. Uh, both have quite a smooth profile and this is in line with um, similar studies into, into P2 cathodes. Moving on to the P3, uh, both are about 145 milliamp hours per gram with a very long plateau at 2.2 volts. And this is very good because it's very handy to have um, 
a consistent voltage plateau like that's repeatable in if you're wanting to get um consistent power out of your um energy device um so it's very uh convenient to have something like that's one of the reasons that uh lfp or the, the so, uh, lithium iron phosphate batteries have been so successful is that you have this very long uh, voltage plateau um we can also see that this solid state p3 uh the position of the plateau shifts slightly uh which is hinting that the the structure is maybe not quite as robust as the uh, the biotemplated equivalent during operation um but both phases act differently uh in during operation so both need to be studied quite uh delicately or thoroughly is maybe a better word so we looked at the differential capacity plot uh of these two batches see if we could see of the four uh samples to see if we could see any anything that's not obvious from the original capacity plot um everything looks very reversible there's no uh there's not a huge number of massive changes um so uh from cycle to cycle um however there are it becomes possible to see when you look at this graph or these graphs that the there are subtle differences in the electrochemistry between solid states uh cathodes and biotemplated cathodes so the biotemplated um p2 has this extra little uh redox peak here so there's um which uh, you know goes down quite significantly after the first peak so it's maybe likely that this is some sort of electrolyte degradation um otherwise you'd expect it to be maybe a little more consistent but i'm that's not necessarily what it is it could also be uh some reordering uh within the material um like reordering of ions within the structure uh similarly this um solid state p3 has an extra reduction peak um even though it's very small so this could also be electrolyte degradation or again it could be some reordering but we can find that out uh using operando techniques uh but overall this shows like quite good uh reversibility and uh quite consistent uh performance over over like only over over only 10 cycles yes but uh it's a very promising uh start particularly for something that's not been particularly for the p3 cathodes where they are significantly less studied than than other structures of cathodes within uh within the literature so it's very promising uh work to go off so uh that's kind of the end of the talk the uh so we've managed to synthesize this phase pure p3 uh and mmo uh via biotemplating which we uh have struggled to do in the past uh this p3 to p2 transition can be moderated through temperature so we can end up with <clears throat> a very variable and tailorable synthesis which can be applied to a lot of different battery structures uh this the p3 and mmo phases are an order of magnitude smaller than uh the, the p2 phases and biotemplating as a technique on the whole results in smaller less variable particle sizes than solid state and um in at least one of our examples has resulted in high capacity so that's the the p2 uh, and mmo simply by changing the uh, synthesis technique for the cathode we end up with uh an uh, an extra ca uh, extra capacity and very good uh like robust or like a very good consistent voltage or like uh discharge capacity um looking into the future uh there's some longer term cycling that needs to be completed and some operando xrd will help us to nail down exactly which phase changes the uh internal structure is going through and whether there are any uh reordering mechanisms taking place uh Cool. So that brings me to the end of, the, end of my talk. Thank you to all these people, in particular, uh, Dr. Becky Boss and Nick Reeves McLaren, uh, for their help for all of my PhD, but also particularly the last nine months. They've been they've been excellent, uh, and also thank you to uh, Dr. Rob Moorhead for his help in uh, a, a lot of the XRD work that I'm doing at the minute. So thanks, everybody. Thank you very much, George. Interesting talk, and you've brought the schedule back on time a bit. So that's welcome. Great.
Uh, any questions, stick them in the chat. Uh, we've got a couple coming in. Uh, first one from Nick Southampton. Uh, the layered structure is very interesting. You highlighted the P3 variant is challenging to produce. Are there clear routes to future scale scalability or are they likely to remain a challenge? Uh, sorry, can you repeat that? <laughs> sorry, I'm, I'm, trying to get, I'm trying to get the chat up, but I can't see the uh, comment. There it is. He's, he's essentially asking if the P3 variant is, if you think it will be scalable. I think so. Um, I mean, the, the, the technique, the synthesis process is very, very rapid, um, certainly compared to the solid state. So it, it can be scaled in exactly the same way that uh, any sort of biosethylating synthesis can. Okay. And then the second question from Robin at Enthoven. Uh, the P3 solid state second reduction peak seems to be reversible. Does this indicate that there are two phases present? Um, I would have to double check. There is there is an impurity in the uh, solid state P3. So it could be that that impurity is electrochemically active and that is what's uh, causing the redox peak. Um, but I would have to do some further testing on that. That's, that's one of the reasons I want to do the... Uh, the operando XRD because it would hopefully show uh, one I, one of the phases changing uh, during cycling. Okay, uh, and I'll I'll ask a quick question if that's all right. Uh, yeah, it it kind of looks like biotemplating. You would be able to get the same well form the phase at a lower temperature of calcination. Uh, you you kind of suggested that you could reduce the calcination time. But could you uh, also reduce the temperature and still get the, the kind of pure phase? Uh, we should be able to, yeah. Um, the, the One of the problems with solid state is that you kind of just have to heat it until you're sure that you formed what it is that you want. Um, but biotemplating seems to uh, sort of reduce that act activation barrier somewhat. Um, so we should be able to do something like that, I think, yeah. All right, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks very much. It's now time for the coffee break uh, and we'll be back in the second half of the session. Okay, welcome back folks. Uh, this is the second part of session four on electrochemical storage. And we have three speakers, uh, in this session. Uh, so we'll be going till five o'clock. Uh, so I'll introduce the first speaker. It's James LeHou from Southampton. And he's going to be talking about X-ray tomography for lithium ion battery, sorry, battery electrode characterization review. So thank you, Dermot. Can you, James, go for it. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Cool, perfect. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, my name's James LaHou. I'm a third year or final year PhD student based down in Southampton, uh, working with Professor Dennis Kramer and Richard Wills. And over the last three years, my PhD has been focused on investigating image-based modeling of lithium-ion batteries. And as part of that, I've got quite familiar with the characterization technique using X-ray tomography to characterize these electrodes. So I thought I'd use this opportunity um, to put that information into a paper and this talk. Um, and so that's what we're going to be talking about today. And um, broadly, I've split up the talk into three different sections. Firstly, a bit of context, talking about uh, how the technique works and why we do it. Uh, secondly, um, going over the past decade, um, some of the techniques that have been developed, um, some of the important papers and results. And then finally, getting to the future, which is the exciting bit, um, so I'm starting a postdoc after this PhD next month, working in this field. Um, so talking about some of the exciting field and where we expect this to go in the next decade. Um, so yeah, James, if you could take it to the next slide. Um, so just to start off, I'll start with a description of what X-ray tomography is We've up there at the top left. Um, essentially it's an imaging technique where we fire X-ray radiation from some sort of radiation source, either a point source or a synchrotron source at a specific sample. And in this case, the sample is looking at lithium ion electrodes, but 
I know we've got a, people from a lot of different broader backgrounds. So for example, um, heat storage, uh, carbon sequestration in rocks, any of these kind of porous or multi-phase materials, this would be a useful technique to be used in. Um, so we take this point source and fire the radiation at the sample and then project that onto a 2D detector, a scintillator. And we can work out where the radiation is being absorbed using a back projection algorithm called um, using Beer's law um, and turn that into a 2D image. And typically these are a thousand by a thousand pixels, these detectors. We then rotate the sample and then repeat the experiments to do another 2D image. And we assemble this group of uh, 2D images, which we can reconstruct into a 3D volume um, to see inside uh, these samples. Um, and so, yeah, broadly, you can either use a point source, which would be probably more typical in a laboratory-based application, uh, or a synchrotron source uh, like Diamond Light Source or Porsche Institute, CERN, and the like. Um, top right, we have a graph of um, search terms and publications over the last decade. You can see that in 2010, Paul Shearing kicked off uh, imaging graphite anode at Diamond Light Source. Um, and since then, we've seen a real proliferation uh, across different techniques, different uh, chemistries, and at different length scales as well. Um, and it's starting to become a really popular technique to really understand how structure and morphology in batteries affects these transport processes. So starting off with the why, at the bottom left, you can see a picture of an 18650 battery cell that's been um, stuck inside a synchrotron and scanned together. Now, at the macroscopic level like this, at this, you can see the length scale of five millimeters. X-ray tomography can be used to capture design parameters and defects in lithium-ion batteries. We think back to our plenary talk at the start of the day. Um, when we're thinking about manufacturing these things, it's a great tool metrologically to be able to analyze how we're putting together these batteries and where any defects might be. So anode and cathode thicknesses, packing density, alignment of assembled cells, manufacturing defects, tab adhesion, all these kind of things and questions can be explored at this level. Um, and I think as we're pushing further towards improving our pack energy density and power density, X-ray tomography has got a really important role to be playing in visualizing and verifying the final assembly of these components, especially across these different form factors. And not only that, I think it's also really important to be looking at the different degradation mechanisms that can happen inside a battery. So delamination, uh, gas formation, aging, islanding, and even looking at some of the more catastrophic failures such as thermal runaway, all these different um, parameters and characteristics can be captured by this technique. So I think it's, it's important at that macroscopic level. And then to the right, we've got the microscopic level, so a much smaller uh, length scale. This is a picture of some of the research I did during my PhD. We've got a lithium ion phosphate pouch cell electrode on the left there. We then scan that in using micro CT to obtain a segmented. So the blue relates to the solid uh, structure in the electrode. The black relates to the electrolyte percolating through. And then we can use that directly as an image um, as our computational domain to solve physical equations on, um, characterize the diffusional properties, look at tortuosity, packing densities, all those kind of things. So really there's these two different length scales um, giving us uh, two different um, sets of parameters, important things we can learn uh, from the battery. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so in terms of the last decade, in terms of current progress, where we're at at the moment, so as I said, lithium ion batteries have got reaction mechanisms operator, uh, operating over these different time and length scales. In order to understand these, we need to develop different experimental techniques to be able to see these different uh, scales. And so namely, we've got ex situ, in situ, and operando. And I'm going to go through each of these, um, introduce them to you. So ex situ is like we saw earlier with the lithium ion phosphate electrode. We're taking specimens that have been removed from the battery. So either um, the materials image before the battery has been assembled or the battery cycled to a specified age and then we're extracting the electrode material from it. Now, anyone who's worked with lithium ion batteries or has seen them probably knows that that can lead to problems, experimental measurement, um, removing material and generally results in destroying a battery. We have to remove that metal steel casing from an 18650, also from a pouch cell. 
Um, so that needs to happen within an air and moisture free environment, so a dry room, a glove box. And we need to be very careful we're not causing spontaneous reactions. So, and also as we're removing it from a battery, we're obviously changing um, the arrangement of that uh, electrode. So in order to counteract against this, uh, in situ experiments were developed. So this is the top right now. Uh, so this is where the battery could be electrochemically cycled in place, in 3D place, but not operated during the tomographic imaging. So there, there are good, big advantages for carrying out the experiment at the same point in space, but with different electrode aging or potential. So we can have a more direct comparison of how that uh, substrate the structure is changing with time. So one common experiment that's been done is to image a pristine electrode. And then again, after a number of cycles with a particular charge or discharge profile, and then we can see the degradation of the structure with time and charge and to see how that's affecting, um, visually see how that's affecting the structure. Um, but as the um, cells are generally uh, wrapped around with a steel casing that affects the absorption of the x-rays, um, it's got a higher stopping power and affects the Beer's law and especially at these microstructure levels, we need to develop specific um, experimental setups to allow us to do this. So what we can see here in this picture on the right, this copper wire has a window made into it, which can then be used as the imaging center. Um, we then assemble our lithium metal and we're looking with electrolyte and what we're looking at is the deposition of this lithium metal on the substrate. Um, so there's a compromise in this case between the image quality and uh, the accurate battery performance because we're getting further away from the battery. But as you can see on the far right with that beautiful pink picture, we can see these uh, lithium dendrites being formed on the substrate. So a combination of these two techniques at situ and in situ allows us to really understand the processes happening within the battery. And then finally, we've got the operando techniques. Operando is where we're looking at uh, with time. So at a synchrotron, uh, uh, we've got a much larger uh, radiation source. So the equivalent scan of a thousand cubed um, down at the nan 100 nanometer level, say for example, for an electrode would take 12 hours in a laboratory based scanner. At a synchrotron, you could do an equivalent scan in sub one second. So the speeds you can get at synchrotrons are you know, you blow you out the water in terms of what we can do. And with that speed means we can really start to capture these dynamic events such as thermal runaway, um, cracking, and you know these really things that are changing with time. So this picture we have down on the bottom left is a silicon uh, anode. And we can see with time, we can see these as being electrochemically cycled. We can see the crack formations, the breakup of the structure, and we can really start to understand um, what's happening um, in the experiment and in the uh, anode. And then obviously we can also start to look at some more extreme examples. So James, if you could play the video on the bottom right, um, this is a picture of an 18650 um, commercial Panasonic cell that's been placed inside a beam line. It's inside a bomb proof box. So we're not breaking any synchrotron um, <laughs> uh, apparatus. And we've wrapped a nickel wire around the end of the uh, uh, cell. And we're heating it up. So what we should see is the layers of the electrode delaminating uh, in a few moments. We can still see the movement now. So we're seeing the gas formation. And this is a very high energy density cell. So actually once we reach our point of um, thermal runaway, the entire thing explodes because it's producing so much gas and we have the contents of the cell is ejected out the top. So understanding this, how the structure of these cells affects the uh, degradation mechanisms, the failure mechanisms, electrode layer collapse, delamination, you know, all these different things. It's really important. Um, and a, a wonderful thing that we can do these kind of experiments is done by Donald Finnegan. Um, if you're interested, I can, I've got a link to all the references at the end. Uh, James, if you could have the next slide, please. Um, so that's where we're at at the moment. And then all the research I have on this page has either been done within the last calendar year, so 2020, uh, or indeed hasn't been done yet. It was some of my postdoc planning on things that are going to be happening in the future. So this will give you a bit of an idea about the direction of travel of where the field's going to be moving. And so to, to start off with, we'll start with multimodal imaging. So this top left uh, box you can see here. 
So this is the practice of combining two different tomography imaging techniques. And the idea of combining these two differing but complementary techniques allows us to have greater microstructure understanding of the lithium ion battery. So if we think back to that slide we had on the first page where I could see where the electrolyte was and the electrode was, there's actually multiple different phases happening inside the battery. So it'd be great if we could be able to ascertain this different information. And to do that, we need to add in other imaging methods which can see these different uh, phases. Uh, so currently there's no single technique that can accurately capture each of these phases. So one way to circumnavigate that is combining these different uh, tomographic imaging techniques. So this case on the top left on the Vanessa Woods group in Switzerland is uh, combining transmission X-ray tomography with tychographic uh, X-ray tomography, which is speckle-based uh, influence where you put a, a filter in front and we can see different uh, characteristics of the uh, structures. So in that segmentation picture E, we can see in the gray, we have our graphite particles, blue, the silicon particles, and we can even see the carbon binder domain in orange, which is fantastic when we want to get down to these uh, modeling uh, parameters to really understand how the structure of this battery is affecting its performance. Um, so to combine these two scans, you need a certain amount of uh, computational know-how. So it uses image reg registration protocols to combine these two things together. And then you can use that as the basis for your simulation, for example. And then another multimodal imaging technique you can see on the top right is combining the combination of X-ray and neutron-based CT imaging. So generally X-rays um, transmission tomography works by uh, the photons interacting with the electron clouds around the elements. And for example, in a lithium ion battery, lithium up right top left of the periodic table has very small electron clouds, so it's hard to see it using X-ray um, transmission tomography. Conversely, neutron imaging interacts with the nucleus, the atom, so it's got a higher sensitivity for lighter elements generally, uh, where the nuclei are more closely packed. So by combining these two different techniques, we can then start to see where the lithium ions are moving through the, uh, the substrate and moving through the structure. And combining these two things, you know, operandoly as well, means we can then start to really see uh, and understand the processes happening within the battery. Both of these uh, uh, published within the last year. Um, then bottom left, this is the, the idea by my postdoc, which I'm going to be starting the next month. Um, the idea is thinking back to those synchrotron light sources, they can capture sub-second dynamic 3D acquisition times. We combine that with a certain amount of reconstruction, segmentation, and then simulation with a suitably high and fast uh, supercomputer. We can then start to get down to real-time simulation results. And by real-time, I mean within the order of minutes. So when you're down at the beamline doing your, cap doing your uh, imaging, you can... Um, start to have this 3D visualization of what's actually happening and use that on the fly to inform the way you can be running your experiments. So you might be interested in some of these dynamic events like islanding, delamination, gas formation, any of these things. You should be able to see that happening through the simulation and adjust your experimental parameters accordingly um, to, to, to focus in on those areas. And then finally, bottom right, we have the idea- Four and idea. a half minutes, James. Cool. Okay, almost finished. Uh, bottom right, we have um, the idea of electrode design. So this is where we're starting to close the loop between real life and virtual reality, which I think is always a really exciting thing to be doing. So on the left here, we have an X-ray tomography of an electrode structure. We can see the particles. And this is a Nature Comms paper by Zhu Lu from uh, UCL. And you can see these colored particles. What he's done is then uh, morphologically adjusted them, so made them smaller. In, inside the computer, so this is done virtually. And then you can run different uh, experimental parameters, simulations, and see how that affects the results. So understanding how lithium ions diffuse. This top layer, by the way, is next to the separator, just so you've got an idea of the direction we're facing uh, inside the battery. And this is the, the first example. This happened in December, so last month it came out. Um, so it's been the first example of this where we're starting to use computational design to inform our structure and understand how that's affecting our, our transport parameters. And as we get to faster computational speeds, we can start to optimize these structures and push it further. So I think it's a really exciting area uh, to be involved in. Um, 
and then yeah, I think that's everything I had. There's one more slide, which is just questions um, and any of the references. Uh, for any of anyone interested in these, uh, it's all going to be published in the Energy Reports paper. Um, so yeah, you can all find it through that. And yeah, thank you for listening. Thanks, James. Uh, there's already a couple of questions popping up here in the chat. First one from John Owen. Uh, he's complimenting your work, and he's also asking. Thank you, John. Did you see? Uh, this is uh, not my area of expertise. Uh, did you see Tomo Aviso etc. Distinguishing between the two solid phases of uh, lithium iron phosphate and iron phosphate in single particles during partial discharge. If, if he was referring to my own work, um, that tomography is not the best example. And I, I, I used it because it was my own work, but there's definitely better examples of lithium iron phosphate. It's a very hard thing to actually image lithium iron phosphate. It's got smaller structure. If I was to go back and do my PhD, I would have started with LCO probably or an NMC. I think that would have been easier. Um, and I think, yeah, we'd need to start to push towards these multimodal techniques to be able to really understand where the phases are. Generally, with the lab-based techniques I'm using in Southampton at the MUVIS, you could see stuff and not stuff, so where you've got your electrode structure and where you've got your electrolyte domain, um, which is good, but obviously, if you want to get to those more detailed images, yeah, you need to use different techniques. Okay. And then there's a question from Onagi, who's asking if this technique can be used for qualitative analysis, for example, to identify new substances formed within the cell. Well, it's, I, it, you'd have to understand, you'd, you'd want to know what is in there before, I think, because, yeah, you, you, it won't give you any inf information about what the substance actually is. You need to understand what the grayscale, you need to probably predict what the absorption is of that structure. But if you know what's already inside the um, structure, yeah. you should be able to see where those things are. I guess I have a question following on for that. So what, what would actually happen if you, if there was a substance in there that wasn't in your library, would it, would it cause an error or would it kind of... You know, it's not necessarily an error. The, the, what you end up with once you've done the post-processing is a series of grayscale values that run from 0 to 256. Imagine lead is one of the most absorbed, absorbing substances. So that would give you a really black image and then white would be probably air. And then every, every different substance sits somewhere on that scale of zero to 256 okay. or 255. Um, so it doesn't give you too much detail without you already knowing that. But then when you start to add in these neutron imaging techniques, then maybe you could start to ascertain what else is there, if that makes sense. Okay. Okay, uh, I think that's it for questions. Cool. Uh, oh, hold on, there's one more just in. Oh no, this is this is a general question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, someone's interested in joining the CDT. They've been inspired. I see. That's that's good. Uh, and I'll let Saul or Andy or Tracy answer that one on the side. Uh, okay, thanks, James. Thank you, Emma. Uh, Take care. Uh, okay, so our next speaker is Ben Craig, also from Southampton, and he's going to talk about ab initio molecular dynamics study of uh, aluminium chloride storage on HEDOPT, whatever that is, conducting polymer chains. So Ben, hopefully you can fill me in on that as well. Yep, absolutely. Sorry, I'm just putting my phone so on. It's a typical moment. Right, um, yes, how's everyone doing? Um, let's get the screen share up. Where's that gone? Oh, where is screen share? It's the green one in the middle at the bottom. Oh yeah, the one that's really clearly lit up, yeah. <laughs> yeah. With you? Okay, let's get this up, okay. All right, is that up, working? Yeah, you're good, sorry. Fantastic. Right, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, uh, I'm Ben, I'll be talking to you about my study um, on ab initio molecular dynamics um, of AOC of four minus anion adsorption um, of P dots on conducting polymer chains. Uh, P dot is poly three, four ethylene doxothiophene. And um, I will very quickly explain the application. Um, 
So this work is originally based on a battery that showed some promise experimentally, which was the aluminium P-dot battery. Uh, now aluminium doesn't work very well as a rocking chair battery uh, because it's trivalent. So um, the problem with these is much like magnesium. Uh, on, on one hand, somebody says, oh yes, well, uh, th these materials carry more than one charge on their ions. And exactly the uh, opposite argument they come straight back and says, well, actually the big problem with these ions is that because they carry more than one charge, they do tend to get stuck in the cathodes when you, um, when, when you insert them. So reversible intercalation is really difficult. And magnesium being a two plus charge is uh, somewhat more likely to work than aluminium with a three plus charge. And although some research has indicated that you can get aluminium in out of things, to a limited degree, um, it's uh, extremely difficult. So the way that these batteries work, which might be called aluminium chloride batteries, is they actually use, um, they, they use um, Al2Cl7 minus um, uh, anions in the electrolytes. And when you charge the battery, you split those into aluminium ions and AlCl4 minus ions. And therefore, when you actually charge the battery, you actually load up the cathode with anions during charge rather than um, inserting cations into the battery during discharge. Um, this makes the battery overall uh, quite limited in terms of uh, specific energy. Um, even if you've got everything right with these batteries, you'd still really struggle to get a battery that was any better in terms of specific energy than lead acid. Um, nevertheless, uh, the batteries actually have really good cycle life um, and durability and very good rate performance. As it turns out, alcl 4 minus uh, with its um, symmetrical shape um, and uh, single charge is actually a really nice charge carrier. It works really well in graphite um, and slightly less well in, in uh, PDOT. Um, however, it's still worth investigating and uh, probably more relevantly, um, the field of conducting polymers as a whole is of great interest going forwards. Um, conducting polymers are starting to appear in everything from things like um, organic uh, light emitting diodes to solar panels uh, and PDOT's even mooted as a uh, potential brain plant um, brain implant uh, material because it uh, conducts electricity um, but uh, is less damaging to the brain than um, uh, traditional metals. The reason it conducts electricity is the conjugated carbon backbone. Uh, when you introduce anions into the system, they uh, create local distortions, which effectively mean uh, they, gener they, they um, hand in extra electrons. The P dot goes into an oxidative state uh, with each additional anion that you introduce. And with a certain percentage of anions present compared to monomer units, the P dots, uh, you, you start getting conduction. And you can vary the number of anions, and that's how you vary the level of charge storage. So my um, entire PhD, due to the fact that I'm using uh, first principles um, ab initio methods, is essentially concentrating on single chains of um, P dots uh, with anions and looking at the various configurations as they build up and really trying to drill down and um, identify uh, what's going on. Um, so moving on. Um, okay, so what is Abinitio molecular dynamics? Um, so, well, Abinitio means first principles for anyone not of a modeling background. Um, so I'm using density functional theory as a basis, um, and that is, uh, and along other, alongside other computational methods, uh, can be used to as part of Abinitio molecular dynamics. So as well as DFT or um, similar methods um, give you basically relaxed uh, geometries uh, locally that are static and tell you things like the, the energy and where the electrons are. Uh, molecular dynamics then goes further and uh, by providing an initial random velocity to, to each nuclei in the system and then solving each step um, uh, using uh, DFT in this case uh, and uh, while also using basically a version of uh, Newtonian mechanics uh, to work out where the nuclei go based on the push-pull of the electron fields and the nuclei and uh, nucleic interactions. Um, the approach I've used my entire presentation last year and accompanying paper was about providing the necessary justification for using uh, this particular DFT method. Um, but suffice to say that it's basically the one that 70-80% uh, of published computational chemistry papers actually use because it gives a really good combination of uh, computational demand. Uh, with accuracy, typically for many systems getting within 5% of experimentally observed parameters. And there's good reason to believe my system would also uh, be the same. Uh, although I'm not able to do that validation myself, that's uh, not something that people can typically do unless that's the pure focus of their work.
So the problem with um, ab initio molecular dynamics, which doesn't apply to classical molecular dynamics, which basically takes a simplified model uh, that um, is more of a is more of a sort of um, a charge a charge focused model, um, is that it's extremely computationally demanding at every single time step. As I said, you're working out the electron density and the electron location of every electron in the system, um, and each of these DFT simulations could, on their own, take um, uh, a, you know, a number of uh, minutes or hours, uh, depending on the system. Um, and the aim really was to understand if uh, doing this actually added anything over a well-designed DFT study. And very much the hope was that, that it wouldn't, uh, precisely because of the computational demand. So the, the logic behind that is that the DFT um, can find uh, local uh, relaxed geometries. So uh, taking a system that you've set up initially, you don't know where the atoms are going to go. And DFT will work down the nearest energy gradient uh, to the local minimum, but it struggles to find a global minimum, uh, which is precisely why uh, uh, the sort of art of finding the, the structure of polymer um, of uh, proteins, for example, is such a big problem in science especially if they're really complicated proteins and uh, why uh, things like that are, are, are big news when, when, when they're completed. Uh, molecular dynamics gets around this by, uh, potentially helps you to get around this by uh, providing a temperature, uh, stimulating the system therefore, and then um, the system will then have time and energy to move potentially into lower energy configurations, as well as uh, informing you about how the system actually moves at temperature. So um, the, in order to actually control molecular dynamics uh, in, a, in a way that approximates real life, you need to introduce a thermostat. And that's just a, a piece of software that goes, or, or some, uh, some code that forms part of a piece of software that acts to maintain the temperature um, according to some, um, some, uh, some method. Um, a conventional lab experiment, for example, you see the, uh, to some degree, the experiment is communicating heat with the uh, outside environment, uh, which could be simplified um, to be considered as an external heat bath, an infinite heat bath. Um, there's a number of choices of software thermostat, and they have different uh, pros and cons. Uh, I won't go through the different thermostats. I chose something called the stochastic velocity rescaling thermostat. It's global, which means it takes a unified approach over the entire system. Um, it's canonical, which means it's uh, basically means it's accepted as a mathematical, um, mathematically true uh, to what's called the canonical ensemble and statistical mechanics. Um, and it acts on the total kinetic energy of the whole system. And the way it does this is once the system's moving, whichever velocity each individual nuclei is moving in, it simply applies an appropriate velocity multiplier along those individual axes of motion. So it scales down or up the motion of every atom in the ensemble by an equal scaling factor in order to adjust the temperature. Um, I liked this um, thermostat uh, uh, partly because of its simplicity as well. It only has two parameters. Uh, the actual time step um, between the, snap, the DFT snapshots that you take and the time relaxation parameter, um, which is effectively how fast the thermostat acts. So a longer time relaxation parameter means that the thermostat takes longer to actually bring the system to an average, which means it allows more oscillations as it does so. Um, whereas a lower value of time relaxation parameter, which is measured in femtoseconds, um, basically means that it acts over a much shorter time frame and you'll get a much noisier result, but one that sticks a lot closer to the temperature you're interested in. So picking appropriate values for these uh, is, is the first step in an investigation like this. Um, so I took this system at the bottom um, and I put these three anions on it. And this was of interest because these three anions were quite likely to experience some kind of movement. Um, and then I ran them with these various uh, parameters which were carefully chosen based on uh, literature and, and so forth. Um, the time step, uh, the basically a longer time step might miss details, uh, but it should theoretically be uh, quicker because it would involve, um, to get to one picosecond, for example, would involve only, um, thousand steps, whereas uh, 0.5 would require up to 2,000 steps and so forth. Um, however, in practice, the 0.5 femtosecond time step came out on top every time. Um, and that's uh, presumably because the, the smaller step between the solutions actually meant it was so much easier to solve that they solved more than twice as fast um, and therefore got through the whole um, selection fastest. So that was the selection for time step, whereas the relaxation time parameter 
um, I, uh, you'll see the details of that on the next page. But first of all, let me show you an animation of what happens when you do this system. And unfortunately, I couldn't get this to output as an Abbey, so I'll have to run it in a different piece of software. Of course, um, this being the main reason that anyone that actually does molecular dynamics in order to get um, a nice visualization of anions and PDOT moving around. And just so we note, your sound is coming and going a bit. I don't know if there's anything particular you're doing. Apparently, it's bad, but it was better about a minute ago. Uh, does it sound okay at the moment? It's good now, right now. I don't know if I was unconsciously covering the microphone in my hand. I don't actually know where it is in the computer. I'll make sure I keep my hands away from the computer. Okay, well, it's, it's good now, so keep doing what you're doing. Okay. Um, okay, so that's a... Uh, so as, as you can see, uh, you get some anions starting to move. Uh, one of these anions is starting to move site. Uh, one of the interesting things I discovered earlier on the PhD was that these anions had a very strong preferred location uh, over the sulfur atoms uh, and they wouldn't actually move from this unless they had a really high degree of um, coulombic repulsion between the anions. So the fact that this anion is trying to move is indicative that these, uh, this, this positioning of having two on either side of the... That didn't work, did it? As an, I'm sharing the wrong screen. New share. Sorry. Zoom problems. Right, let me try that again. Right, so this was, this is the molecular, um, this was the animation I was trying to do. So you can see on the right hand side here, um, the uh, two anions uh, being opposite each other on the same p-dot is, uh, does not appear to be a stable configuration and therefore the uh, system is trying to move, uh, one of these anions is trying to escape and what it's going to do is going to jump two to avoid traveling um, across the plane of the p-dot. It's going to go round the bottom of this p-dot on the right and uh, situate itself uh, on, on the next sulfur atom across. And it never quite, get, never quite gets there in the, in the solution time. Now this run took about um, five or six weeks to generate. Uh, by the time you factor in all the, uh, the, the the full starts and the cancellations and the restarts and everything, just to give you an idea how long it takes to generate uh, one picosecond of um, ab initio molecular dynamics at what's actually a very reasonable level of um, detail. Let's go back onto the... One second. Um, the parameterization results uh, came out as follows. Um, so you can see with a uh, the various um, different time relaxation parameters, a shorter time relaxation parameter, um, what it does is it actually creates a very noisy result, but it goes straight to the temperature um, of 305 Kelvin, which was uh, 303 Kelvin, which is 25 degrees room temperature, which was the target. And it stays there quite nicely. Um, the 25 femtosecond um, time relaxation parameter uh, still is quite good, um, but it takes a little bit longer to get there. Whereas the 250 femtosecond time relaxation parameter takes uh, never uh, actually goes above the temperature and never actually comes down. Um, and you can see a similar thing actually on the right. If you didn't have a thermostat, you would have a total energy that basically stayed at its original value. Um, and what you're getting with the um, with the thermostats is that you're getting a much more uh, noisy exchange of the total energy as the system tries to control the temperature. So for this reason, um, because it was the least noisy option that actually brought the system to the correct temperature, uh, ongoing work went with the 25 femtosecond time step. So um, similar to uh, Jethro's uh, work on uh, cluster expansions, uh, part of the novelty of my work, which this is building up to is uh, the use of cluster expansions on polymers and treating polymers, uh, polymer sites as lattices. Um, now these anions, uh, because they've got a distinct location on the polymer, you can actually start treating the lattice site. 
Uh, and this, uh, in order to do this, then you have to identify all of the symmetry unique configurations. Um, based on preliminary work, it was useful at this stage to conduct some research with um, some free polymer chains at either end, which meant that you got rid of the end effects of the polymer, which were quite strong. Uh, and so these, uh, if, if you only have, um, if you only have up to four anions on the middle two uh, p dot chains of a system, these are your seven unique uh, configurations. Uh, four minutes left, Ben. Okay. So the runs I considered um, were frozen p dot chain to isolate the effects of anion movement, uh, DFT only uh, simulation, and uh, various lengths of ab initio molecular dynamics followed by um, DFT optimization. Uh, these are the results. Uh, so on the left is the total energy. So as uh, these are the configurations, um, and uh, as you go from configurations one to seven, uh, you realise that the that the frozen chain, uh, because it doesn't allow any deformation, has a noticeably higher energy. And uh, very fortunately, uh, the differences between the rest of the approaches between DFT and also having various lengths of AIMD uh, is actually very small. Um, you really don't get much change at all. Uh, the right-hand graph is essentially taking the lowest energy of each configuration, normalizing to zero, and you can see um, that the spread is limited um, so that you've got um, configurations four, six, and seven have a spread of a reasonable spread of energies, whereas configurations one, two, um, and um, three and five have uh, much less of a spread. Uh, and what this tells you is that uh, these configurations uh, con uh, go with the configurations that had opposing pairs of anions. Uh, and actually, uh, in almost all of these, the uh, anions have moved. And so one of the, the most important learnings from this is that the anions are not stable in opposing pairs on the PDOP. Uh, and that can be that's demonstrated here by um, the movement from uh, four opposing anions, to, uh, two opposing anions and two adjacent polymer chains. Um, that, that just completely destabilizes and the two anions drift off to either end. And the other thing you learn is that the AIMD introduces lots of uh, twist and bend into the polymer chain, which is just a function of temperature and noise. Uh, and then actually, if you run a subsequent DFT optimization, that all disappears. So the conclusion you can take from that is that the uh, bend and the twist of the polymer is far less important than the position of the anions. Um, and that's reassuring because it means that molecular dynamics has not in fact found lower energy configurations. It's just added noise. Uh, it's helped you to identify which configurations were unstable in the first place, but there's no good reason to continue using uh, molecular dynamics in the future. And uh, I think that must be about my time. Yeah, you've got a minute or so more. Okay. Um, there, there was an interesting point there, which was that the uh, anions when they're opposing each other on the chain, because they don't always destabilize. Uh, sometimes they do and sometimes they don't, which does indicate that um, we're finding barrier energies to, to the movement is, is quite tricky. Uh, it's very close to the energy, um, the, the energy surplus involved in having two anions on one polymer uh, units rather than uh, having one, uh, or rather than having them on adjacent polymer units. And uh, yeah, so any questions? Cheers, Ben. Uh, are there any questions from the audience? Okay, uh, I'll, I'll ask a quick one. And it's just on uh, kind of computing time. You, did you say it was five to six weeks to run the kind of augmented simulation? Yeah, so it's not, it doesn't work out being that long in, in actual simulation time, but I was running these on um, 400 CPUs and in total the simulation time. Um, and, and they would regularly, uh, the more complicated the, the modeling, it, they, they never run in a straightforward way. They find novel ways to fail every time. And so there's a difference between the number of hours that um, goes in, that they actually run on the supercomputer for and uh, the number and the amount of time it takes. So this whole study actually took me um, uh, six continuous months. And, um, and from it, the scientific conclusions are somewhat sparse, I'll be completely honest with you, uh, which is why it was so good to rule out this um, approach for future work. Okay, thanks. Sounds a bit frustrating, but. <laughs>
Okay, you get a nice picture of some wiggly, wiggly balls. <laughs> yeah, true. Uh, okay, a quick question for James from James, then we'll wrap up. Uh, and he's saying, now that you've validated your DFT approach, what next? Um, get some scientific results or results of scientific interest, I think would be next. And uh, probably quite urgent for the PhD at this stage. Nice one. And what, what is the kind of high level, the application side of this? Uh, um, so from this, you eventually could uh, predict things like the charge discharge curve of the polymer. You can predict which configurations are most stable and you can um, look at one of the main interesting points actually is what's the maximum level of anions uh, to, to, monomer, to P dot monomer units can you actually sustain? Um, because it's normally thought of as one to three, um, but the experimental results indicated it might be actually one to one, which is much higher than expected. And that, that change of paradigm, if it's correct, is actually very valuable for polymer science. Okay, good. All right, cheers, Ben. And our last speaker for the session is Jonathan Allen, who's going to be talking about polymer films on graphite anodes for prevention of thermal runaway in lithium ion batteries. So, Jonathan, whenever you're ready, go for it. Sorry. Hello, am, am I coming through all right? Yeah, I can see and hear you. Yes. All right, so I'm going to be talking about polyacrylonitrile films in lithium ion cells for prevention of thermal runaway. Uh, slight title alteration. Uh, I removed the graphite anodes because, in theory, these could be applied to most electrode configurations, but I've been fundamentally looking at graphite for the purposes of my work. Uh, and I, this has been with the supervisors, Andrew Hector and Nero Garcia at the University of Southampton. So to cover the contents, I'll quickly go over the, the working principles of lithium ion cells and thermal runaway that occurs during their failure. Uh, I'll try not to bore you with all of that. And then I'll go on to the aims and purposes of my PhD and the possible applications of what I'm looking at, uh, or the possible ways it can be applied even. Uh, and then I'll go for the roots investigation and the working principles behind them before briefly concluding at the end. So lithium ion cells, they use lithium ions, go from a anode to a cathode uh, to join up with electrons that they integrate into the electrode surface during the discharge. Uh, they form just uh, uh, the lithium batteries themselves are made up of a anode, a cathode, a separator, and an electrolyte. The anode is typically the material that is full of lithium during the fully charged state, whereas the cathode is full, completely empty of lithium. The separator is just to keep these two things apart, and then the electrolyte is the conductive media through which the ions can travel. Meanwhile, the electrons will travel through an external circuit. And it is the travel of the electrons and the lithium ions that I'm particularly interested in. Uh, so keep this in mind that the electrode electrolyte interface, the lithium ions and the electrons must meet in order to form that lithium in order for the discharge charging processes to occur. So in thermal runaway, the temperatures of the lithium battery will run away. They will increase excessively until you reach a catastrophic, possibly explosive failure. So in the bottom left there, I've got a picture from quite a famous one from a Tesla car that exploded back in 2013. And then in the bottom right is a picture of one of the Samsung phones that failed back in 2016, which caused them to have to limit their battery life by about 60% and have to call back most of the phones that they released at the time. Uh, and graphically, the way thermal runaway works is you get an increase in heat, causes more exothermic reactions, causes an increase in reaction rate, and this will go round and round and round in a cycle uh, until the temperatures reach an excessive point. Throughout this process, you'll get different materials start to break down. So you, you will initially start to see the electrode and the electrolyte breaking down. Um, commonly, it's the electrolyte first, or the anode first, followed by the electrolyte, followed by the cathode. Uh, and then you'll hit an internal short circuit when there's normally the separator melts and then you hit runaway temperatures during the thermal runaway event. So the aims of my PhD 
are to successfully integrate a polymer material into the cell structure. So polymers are commonly used in batteries anyway. Uh, you, you're already familiar with the separators. These are most normally used with polymers. Um, binders are normally used where you mix the active material with a polymer matrix in order to hold your active material together. So that might be your graphite or your lithium ion phosphate, whatever material you're trying to use. Uh, and then another way in which polymers are being investigated in use is to replace the liquid electrolyte. During heating events, liquid electrolyte tends to form gases or it decomposes, the organic elements decompose into gases, which increase the pressure buildup, which causes increases in temperatures, which further exacerbates the thermal runaway problem. So polymer electrolytes are potentially good at avoiding that. It also removes the toxic and hazardous chemicals inherent inside of the liquid electrolytes themselves. And then after doing that, I'm looking at preventing the thermal runaway with the polymers playing a more functional role than these passive polymers. So I want to introduce something called a positive coefficient of positive temperature coefficient of resistivity, also known as PTCR. So you can see graphically here, uh, as you increase in temperature, you get a slight decrease in resistivity until you hit a transition temperature point. So at this in this case, it's 80 Celsius, where the resistivity will jump up by orders of magnitude usually. Uh, and then that will should, in theory, provide a shutdown effect to prevent the battery from working, preventing the lithium ions and the electrons from meeting, preventing the runaway temperatures from occurring. So to introduce you to my film trilogy, uh, so I'm going to be looking at, firstly, a shutdown effect uh, film where the film prevents the lithium ions from getting into the anode or cathode surface. And then I'll be looking at a percolation effect, which will be preventing the electrons from reaching this interface point. And in order for the PTCR effect to be observed, one of these needs to functionally just prevent their charge particle from reaching that zone. So shutdown films the most commonly used in separators. So the most common one that people are familiar with is CellGuard, which is polypropylene, polyethylene, polypropylene in a trilayer structure. The polypropylene on either side of the polyethylene provides a structural backing where and it has a much higher melting temperature. So what you find is as you hit the 130 Celsius, the polyethylene will melt while the PP retains its structure. And it will close off the pores through which the ions can transport, preventing the ion transport from occurring. And what I want is a similar effect to be observed in the films on my electrode surface. So I've been looking at a single layer material polyacrylonitrile. So on the right here is a example of polyacrylonitrile being used as a separator, where they managed to get this PTCR effect. And I've left the reference at the bottom there. Uh, so they got observed a PTCR around 80 Celsius. Uh, normally, you'd expect this to occur around the transition temperature, which is around 95 Celsius. And this is just because at the transition temperature is where you get the biggest structural changes occurring. So for glass transition, this is where you go from brittle to ductile. So your chains become more mobile, it allows the polymer chains to move and rearrange, possibly closing off the pores. Uh, for melting, similar process, it just goes from solid to liquid and allows it to close off the pores. And this is normally accompanied by a large thermal expansion. So, um, going over the separators. So, polyacrylonitrile is among some of the most common polymer materials used. I think it's the third most common used. Uh, on the right there, I've always shown you that it can be used as a separator. It's also been investigated to, prove, to replace some binders in the active material. So, it is quite a versatile material that has seen much use in lithium ion cells already. So, it seemed quite an apt choice in order to pursue my research on. Uh, and then there, that's the figure of showing the operation I would like to observe. So when you increase temperature, you get a swelling of the polymer film, prevents the ions from reaching the surface. And then ideally, when you decrease the temperature, it becomes reversible and it will retain its operation. With melting transitions, this will not be observed because you've irreversibly changed structure. With a glass transition, this is potentially possible. Uh, I have not yet observed this in my research, but if it if I can achieve it, it'll be possibly groundbreaking. It, it would be very nice to achieve. 
uh, in order to apply polyclonal trial as a film, I've been looking at electrographing grafting it. Uh, polyclonal trial is well known to electrograft to pretty much any conductive surface. So which, that's why I've been using graphite, but as long as your anode or cathode is conductive, you can electrograph polyclonal trial to it. And the general process is that a oxygen atom, oxygen atom, an oxygen molecule in the solution of your deposition electrolyte, graphene electrolyte, will be reduced to a superoxide anion. This will then interact with a monomer of a colonitrile, which then allows it to move on to the initiation step. And it's able to interact with the monomers because the vinyl group, CN at the bottom, is elec inherently electrodeficient. Uh, and it allows the, well, it introduces electrodeficiency to the mole molecule, which allows it to be more reactive with the anion of the superoxide. And then during initiation, the monomer will bind to the electrode surface and retain its negative charge, which will then propagate down a chain of monomers until it eventually terminates, leaving you with the polymer chain on the electrode surface. So this is pictures of the results I've so far observed. So you can see on the left there is just clean graphite, nothing's been done to it at all. And then on the right is with the polymer placed on the surface. And this is at, I believe, 20 times magnification. Um, and you can see on the right, which has been causing me quite a lot of hiccups in my work, it's the surface of the polymer is quite cracked. Ideally, I'd like a nice clean, clean film where only the pores are allowing the ions to transport. Problem is with the cracks is that if, they, if they're too large, they'll allow the lithium ions to move through even when I hit these higher temperatures. Um, but the it, cracking is an inherent property that you tend to get when you electrograft the polyacrylic nitrile uh, because it will crack during the drying process of the electrolyte, which is something I've been trying to remove or trying to remove throughout my work because this cracking is not good for my potential operation at higher temperatures. Uh, moving on to the percolation films. So as you increase the temperature, oh, sorry, I should explain what percolation film is first. You get a, a polymer matrix. So I've observed, I've represented that with a big gray circle. And that is then filled with conductive blue spheres, which can be carbon most commonly. It could be some sort of metal. So just as long as it's conductive and that will form a electron pathway it effectively turns your insulating polymer into a conductive composite material, allowing electrons to reach wherever you want them to. Uh, the idea of percolation is that there is a point at which it will become conductive. Uh, and this is known as the percolation threshold. If you go below this point, it goes back to an insulating composite. If you go above it, it just becomes more and more conductive. Uh, so these can be applied either side of the current collector just so long as, as it's behind the anode or cathode active material. Um, and the idea is that it will just stop the electrons when it increases in temperature. Because thermal expansion of the polymer matrix will cause the chains to break, the conductive chains to break, preventing the electrons from passing through. And as long as it doesn't melt, it should return to normal on a decreasing in temperature. Or as long as it doesn't suffer an irreversible structural change. So in a composite, it's purely just your conductive additive and your polymer binder. Uh, and why am I playing it with, uh, is it possible with polyclonatrol? It's literally possible with pretty much any polymer matrix conductive media that I've seen. Uh, I've seen polyethylene oxide being used, so PEO, PE. Uh, I've seen um, polypropylene being used. And I've seen all, all sorts of things from carbon conductive additives, stainless steel, even like nickel being used. But the reason why I'm mostly using polyacrylonitrile is for that 95 Celsius, quite comparatively low transition temperature. And when it hits that temperature, because of the glass to uh, the glass transition temperature being from ductile to brittle, it greatly increases the amount of expansion that can occur, which will accelerate the rate at which the electrons chains have been broken. Uh, so an example of this being used on the right, I left the reference at the bottom there again, is in high density polyethylene with carbon black composites. Uh, so you can see as you vary the composition, so as you increase carbon black, your D 
decreasing that peak in uh, resistivity that you're getting. This is known as the percolation intensity. It's broadly the ratio between the room temperature resistivity and then the higher elevated temperature resistivity. So what you want is to get as close as possible to the percolation threshold, where you will maximize the percolation intensity, which will maximize your PTCR effect and allow greater resistivity changes to occur. It's also been noticed in, noted in quite a lot of literature that these properties of glass, the properties of glass transition temperature are highly tailorable. So as you, I think I remember it being, if you added stainless steel to the mixture, it decreased the glass transition temperature that you observed. Uh, and you can see slight changes. So you can technically tailor the glass transition temperature to be at a more appropriate temperature if 95 Celsius is too high, or if you're looking at a different polymer with potentially far too high temperatures or glass transition, maybe about 150 Celsius. It's your five minute warning. Uh, thank you. Um, <laughs> That's fine. I've gone a bit too quick. So in summary, uh, lithium ion cells suffer from catastrophic failures during thermal runaway. Uh, one method to avoid thermal runaway is through material integration. Uh, material integration is quite important because it allows a quick and responsive, quick and immediate response to the onset of higher temperatures that are inside the cell without having any ancillary equipment attached, such as a battery management system. Um, Polyacrylonitrile films can be applied in several ways to introduce PTCR effect. So I've gone through the shutdown effect films, the percolation films. Uh, other materials are available. So polyacrylonitrile is quite similar to PVDF, which can be looked at being applied as a film. Uh, and my research on these shutdown films has been applied and is undergoing final battery testing. Uh, I've done this at elevated temperatures to observe a PTCR effect. Uh, unfortunately or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, I'm currently looking to publishing that as a paper. So I've left these results out of the presentation for now, just to give myself as good chance of publishing as possible. Uh, and my research in paper collection films is just begin beginning. I recently got my setup working uh, and it looks, it looks promising at the moment from what I've observed. So thank you for listening. Uh, any questions? Thank Sorry, you that was a bit <laughs> Uh, there's a question here from Dan Wright. Yep. He's saying, have you tried calendaring, calendaring after the deposition of the film to see if it smooths out the cracked surface? No, that's not something I've tried yet. It's, it's worth looking at. I was slightly worried that calendaring might damage the polymer more, but I, I'll try it on one of, the, yeah. one of the films that I'm less confident on, see if it actually has quite, quite see if it has positive improvements to it. I do calendar beforehand. So I calendar the graphite and then I deposit onto that. So that's normally what I've been doing. Okay. I mean, I, I get, it would seem to me that even if there are cracks, you're covering up most of the surface. So you'd probably still be able to yes. run away, but I guess you, you'd have to test it to know it. Uh, the, the problem I've been seeing is that there's a problem with the intensity I've been getting. So I've been getting much lower than what I would like. So normally you'd like a, so I go to this slide, you want several orders of magnitude upwards. Um, I've been getting much smaller, which isn't necessarily bad for applications. Uh, what you could do is you could use a batch management system to monitor the change in resistivity and then shut down the cell using outside equipment. But the whole point of applying these materials is trying to avoid that sort of setup so I'd like it to have a good percolation intensity if possible. Okay. Actually, well, while you're on that side, I've got a question about that. I don't have a good feeling for the, the kind of values on the y-axis here for resistivity. Uh, but it looks to me that if you want to get that kind of peak effect where it suddenly jumps in resistivity, you have to add enough of the material that you've actually generally increase the resistivity of the, the film, if you see what I mean. So is that a problem? Yes. So uh, if I go back to here, so the material that will be doing the percolation effect is this small little strip. Yeah. You've got the cathode or anode material on top. This is your aluminium or copper current collector. So this small strip needs to be electronically conductive. Yeah. Otherwise, you, it won't work during normal operation anyway. So it's, it's about trying to just 
balance getting a good conductivity so that you're not hindering the operation of the cell to trying to get a good shutdown effect occurring. So it, it's a bit finicky and it's something I'm going to be looking at quite extensively. Um, yeah, it's something to okay. consider. Yep, thanks for that. All right, uh, if there's no other questions there, that brings us to the end of the, the session. So I'd just like to thank all the speakers uh, from this afternoon for some really interesting talks.